Um, and I too would like to begin by thanking the organizers for all the work you've put into this um, and the ongoing work you put into this. Thank you very much. And also thank you for your hospitality. Um, I am quite moved by, by the generosity you, you've shown us. Um, so I've been working on a project on the cultural history of the face. I started thinking about it during the pandemic, around debates about COVID masks and what they revealed about faces, whether they are legible, what they say, why indeed we would say that we read faces to begin with. I also started thinking about it in relation to debates about facial recognition technologies, which reduced the face to a minimalist form, operation reminiscent of the old pseudoscience of physiognomy. It is a hard word, and I will tell you more about it. Um, at the same time, in the political sphere, power was visible as a certain ubiquitous face, and we've invoked the name of Trump um, a few times, but I'm sure you remember that his face was everywhere. As someone who works on literature, I take these questions to a literary archive. We've had a few papers in the conference that seem to amount to a through line regarding literature and authority what literature teaches us about authority, and what kind of authority literature is. Eric brought up the other day, and then again today, the fact that we are largely thinking about political masters, and perhaps we need to think about other kinds of masters as well, whether authors or master theorists. So I'll be thinking here about the figure of the author as a master. Um, and I should say, and I'll return to this, that I'm also really intrigued by the wonderful poster we have for our conference. Um, an empty golden frame, framing, as I see it, what used to be a portrait and presumably a face. Uh, one of the questions I have when I see this image, right, and the choice of the frame is quite eloquent, um, is whether, there is a whether a face is always there even in its, in its absence. Um, and then how do we think about the genre and the conventions of the portrait in relation to the figure of the master? Right? Whether that would be a literary portrait or a visual portrait and so on and so forth. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. So today I will tell you a little bit about the very particular literary figure of the master, um, Aschenbach in Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, and his figuration as a face. How does one know a master in literature? One answer we have comes from the history of physiognomy, highly influential in Western modernity, which equips the figure of the master with a certain face. In this history, there is a strong correlation between inside and outside, the interiority of the master and his facial appearance. I'm sure you know that the most influential proponent of physiognomy was Johann Kaspar um, Lapater. Um, there is a whole history of the Enlightenment to be told through the lens of his work and its, its reverberations across Europe. Since the 18th century, physiognomy worked to naturalize a relation between character and face. Physiognomy worked with the assumption that what can read the interiority of a person from outward appearance, centrally from the face. It, it posited a connection, and this is the formulation on the slide, between visible surface and interior spirit. In the process, Avatar produced a racialized hierarchy of faces, with ancient Greek faces at the top and African faces at the bottom. Extremely popular and influential, physiognomy functioned as an education in seeing and interpreting faces. Physiognomy popularized the idea of physiognomic tact the faith that one can cultivate physiognomic skills to the point of their becoming automatic, a form of intuition. A Swiss pastor, Lapater framed his work in physiognomy as contributions to science. And for, for quite some time, they were accepted as such by the 18th century scientific community, with notable exceptions, like the, the name of Lichtenberg is quite important there. Lafater became a celebrity of Van la Lettre. Anybody who was anybody in Europe traveled to Zurich to meet him. Goethe admired Lafater and contributed to the German edition of his essays before the two had a falling out. 
In turn, La Pater included a sketch of Goethe's face, accompanied by a highly laudatory description of his face, which he considered to be the face of a genius. The friendship with Goethe would become highly consequential for literature's encounter with physiognomy. And I'll return to Goethe later in this talk. Now, one might be tempted to dismiss physiognomy as a mere uh, historical curiosity. I think that would be a mistake. Considered a science, a pseudoscience, or an art form, physiognomy branched out in the 19th century, permitting everyday life, workplaces, the legal system, science, and the arts. Even clouds were thought to possess a physiognomy in need of reading and classification by analogy with faces, as meteorologists tried to read what they called the face of the sky. This is one of my favorite pieces on, on physiognomy by historian of science, Laurent Gaston, who, who looks at 19th century uh, cloud atlases uh, and, and the kind of taxonomy they developed by analogy with uh, physiognomy. In the long run, the ramifications of physiognomy are difficult to miss. Contemporary practices of racial profiling in policing go back to physiognomic criminology. Perceptions of facial inscrutability with a long history of Orientalism behind them go back to physiognomy. Discourses of disability often enlist physiognomic notions of deformity. Queerness has at times been read physiognomically. The emergence of visual technologies from photography to cinema to facial recognition have, uh, have, have been implicated with physiognomy. Gladden Dollar has discussed the appearance of both phrenology and physiognomy in Hegel, analyzing formulations like, quote, spirit is a bone, or, quote, the reality of man is his face, as the temptation, quickly dismissed by Hegel, to think the unity of interiority and exteriority. Both phrenology and physiognomy, nonetheless, were embedded in the project of the Enlightenment, and that they tried, and obviously spectacularly failed, but the trying remains eloquent, to provide spirit with a material basis and establish a scientific link between psychic functions and material foundations. So I am interested in the history of this temptation, which again Hegel puts aside, but which endure and is arguably still with us, in what has come to be known as the physiognomic fallacy. So I slowly come to my case study, Thomas Mann, but first a few qualifications on modernist physiognomy. So the most influential phase in the history of physiognomy, which builds on the work of Lafater, unfolded between 1770s and the 1880s. This wave of physiognomy ended, therefore, before the modernist moment. But while physiognomy waned in modernism, it did not disappear. Rather, and this is my argument, modernism reconfigured physiognomy. And I, I concur with Marion Zilio in a brilliant recent book, um, for which I wrote a review just the other day, uh, when she writes, the face now seems more like the return of the repressed. And by the way, the return of the repressed seems to be a leitmotif in our, in our conference. Um, now, one of the platforms for the reproduction of some of physiognomy's tenets is literature. The trope of the face as book is probably as old as literature, although it does not always have physiognomic dimensions. So is the idea that looking at the face constitutes a mode of reading? To be sure, literary texts often dramatize physiognomic knowledge with a lot of ambivalence, and often as a mode of comedy. Like physiognomy is the, it's the stuff of comedy. Uh, uh, um, an important reference remains um, Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe's short story, um, A Man of the Crowd, which has its narrator read the faces in a London crowd, only to be stumped by an opaque face that refuses to be read. Or indeed, Oscar Wilde's the, the Picture of Dorian Gray, with its ambivalent dramatization of the relation between a face and its physiognomic representation. Beyond such thematic ambivalence, however, modern literature arguably transformed a version of physiognomy into a principle of composition, especially in the novel. Most importantly, the concept of character, right, what we call literary character, has emerged and developed within a physiognomic conceptual constellation. It is difficult to imagine a literary character without a face, however defaced this might be. Uh, however defaced this face might be. And Paul de Man has a really important essay on all of this. We can, we can uh, discuss that um, further. 
Within modernism, two historical texts provide a narrative arc for the politics of the face. The first is a short but highly influential essay published by German sociologist of modernity, Georg Simmel, in 1901, titled The Aesthetic Significance of the Face. As I'm sure you know, Simmel was an important figure in turn of the century Berlin, where he trained a generation of modernist theorists and writers. Benjamin, Krakauer, Balas, Bloch, they all studied with Simmel. They were all deeply interested in the history of physiognomy as well. The second text anchoring uh, my, my um, framework here is a futurist pamphlet. It's a wonderful, wonderful document um, published by British-American poet Mina Loy in 1919, titled, quite ironically, Autofacial Construction. While Zimmel diagnoses the centrality of the face in modernity, framing it as a socio-aesthetic phenomenon, Loy proposes a range of strategies for what she calls reclaiming the face. She argues for the right, and this is uh, her formulation, uh, the right for our facial mastery. Now taken as two poles in a narrative arc, these two texts provide a historical and conceptual framework for an analysis of the face, and again, the endurance of physiognomy. Walter Benjamin, in an essay on Proust, this is a wonderful, wonderful essay on Proust, can be said to have captured the period's ambivalence towards this discourse through much of his theoretical work. This is a quote. The wrinkles and creases on our faces are the registrations of the great passions, vices, insights that called on us. But we, the masters, were not home. Benjamin wrote in one of the most memorable takes on physiognomy, and note the invocation of the, of, of the figure of the master there. So I now come to Munn's death in Venice, and I'll, I'll return briefly to Benjamin later. Um, so I should emphasize from the outset that this is early Thomas Mann, engaged in turn, turn of the century cultural politics. Thomas Mann, who at the time insisted that his literature was apolitical. There is no doubt to me, uh, in my mind, that um, death in Venice figures Aschenbach as a master, very particular kind of master. He's an established canonical author. He works hard. Indeed, one of his features as a master is his work ethic. He's famous. High school students uh, read his work. He imagines himself in control of his destiny. And he indeed produces his canonicity and maintains it over time. The metaphor, um, some of you might remember, uh, used by the text for Aschenbach's self-discipline is that of the clenched fist. Uh, Mann's story is about the relaxation of this fist, and with it, potentially, the loss of his mastery. So a very specific figure of the master as a literary author, a writer, and a canonical author. Here, then, is the portrait of Aschenbach, which is offered at the very beginning of the novella, but has the air of an obituary upon la lettre. This is what Aschenbach's readers will have read in a newspaper upon his death, Mann uh, eloquently puts it at the very beginning of his novella. So I'll read it in the English translation, uh, but I've put up the German if you prefer to read that instead, and you'll see that the, the German is quite different. Quote, Gustav von Aschenbach was, a, was a rather less than average height, dark and clean shaven. His head seemed a little too large in proportion to his, to his almost delicate stature. His brush back hair, thinning at the top, very thick and distinctly gray over the temples, framed a high, deeply lined, scarred-looking forehead. The gold bridge of his rimless glasses cut into the root of his thick, nobly curved nose. His mouth was large, often limp, often suddenly narrow and tense. His cheeks were thin and furrowed. His well-developed chin had a gentle cleft. And this is the part that interests me. Significant destinies seem to have left their mark on his head, which usually leaned sideways as if in pain. And yet, it was art that had here undertaken the task of forming the features, which is usually the work of a difficult, agitated life. Beneath this brow had been born the brilliant dialogue of the conversation about war between Voltaire and the king. These eyes, gazing warily and profoundly through the glasses, had seen the bloody inferno of the military hospitals of the Seventh Year's War. Yes, even on a personal basis, art is an enhancement of life. 
It, serves, it makes you more deeply happy. It wears you out faster. It engraves on the face of its servant traces of imaginary intellectual adventures. So, a great man is revealed through a great face. The description functions um, as what we call a physiogn physiognomic hagiography. La Fater wrote numerous such hagiographies, including one of Goethe, uh, who was one of Thomas Mann's heroes. So did Balzac, so did Oscar Wilde, so did Proust. In Mann's portrait, Aschenbach displays a noble nose. His mouth is tense, a trace of his determination and hard work. Um, Michael Tausing refers to Aschenbach's face as a fist face, right, by analogy with a clenched um, fist. Myriad adventures have been formative of this physiognomic design, right, and the, the German for that is physiognomische Durchbildung. These adventures do not come from direct experience, but from Aschenbach's imaginative and intellectual work. The art he has created or contemplated engraved itself on Aschenbach's face. It dug material furrows into his skin. Art, Aschenbach's writing, has brought him canonical status, a noble name, von Aschenbach, and a noble face, even a noble nose. In short, serving art, Aschenbach has become a master. So there is a really interesting anecdote related to this passage that uh, I just read. In 1921, 10 years after the publication of Death in Venice, Wolfgang Born made a series of nine lithographs for an illustrated edition of Death in Venice. And one of them is on the slide. A copy of this illustrated edition was sent to Thomas Mann. Mann was stunned uh, to see it and experienced a little crisis. The face Born gave Aschenbach, and you'll see a version of it in the lower right side. The face Born gave Aschenbach surprised Mann because he had not publicly mentioned that he had modeled Aschenbach's face on composer Gustav, uh, Gustav Mahler's face, which he now saw in Born's lithographs. Mahler's face had made a strong impression on Mann when the author met the composer in 1910, and Mann thought that Mahler had the face of a genius. Mahler died in 1911 as Mann was working on Death in Venice. At the time, Mann cut a photograph of Mahler from a newspaper. In 1921, faced with Born's lithographs, Mann acknowledged that in 1911 he had given Aschenbach, and this is a quote from Thomas Mann's correspondence, Mahler's mask when describing his appearance. The question became, how could Born, the artist who produced the lithographs, have known since Mann had not spoken public publicly about the Aschenbach-Mahler connection? Mann assumed it, it assumed it to be a case of reverse ekphrasis. Mann uh, born visually captured a Mahler face from the verbal description of Aschenbach's face in Death in Venice, which, unbeknownst to Born, was in fact modeled on a photograph of Mahler. The anecdote, much rehearsed in the wake of Lucino Visconti's decision to model his cinematic Aschenbach on Mahler and use Mahler's music as a stand-in for Aschenbach's art in his um, 1971 film adaptation of Death in Venice, condenses an almost magical faith in the legibility of a human face and its translation from one medium to another. So we know that the figure of the master in Mann and elsewhere is constructed in relation to a number of minor characters. As we know in the history of literature, minor characters are often servants. Two of the four minor characters in the gallery of minor characters in Death in Venice are particularly eloquent. And there are four really important uh, kind of minor characters that help consolidate Aschenbach's portrait. I'll only talk about two. One is the gondolier who takes Aschenbach to the Lido. The other is the musician at the Lido. Here's how these two minor characters are described, both as a function uh, of what the text refers to explicitly as a facial type. So this is the gondolier. And again, oh, you can read the, the German if you prefer. He was a man of displeasing, indeed, indeed brutal appearance, wearing blue seaman's clothes with a yellow scarf round his waist and a shapeless, already fraying straw, straw hat tilted rakishly on his head. To judge by the cast of his face, to judge by the cast of his face. 
and the blonde, blonde curling mustache under his snub nose, he was quite evidently not of Italian origin. Occasionally, the effort made him retract his lips and bare his white teeth." End of quote. Gesichtsbildung, translated as the cast of the face, very much belongs to the physiognomist's vocabulary. Scrutinizing the gondolier's face with a short nose standing out, and um, I'm sure you know that the nose is the most racialized feature in Lavater and physiognomy more, more broadly, Aschenbach immediately rules out Italian ancestry. Schlag is the German word. Uh, again, uh, Michael Tausing, in a brilliant reading of Death in Venice, refers to this facial predicament as a face without a country. Note that Aschenbach is confident declaring the gondoliers non-belonging in Venice, although he is a visitor. Later in the novella, the scenario is repeated as Aschenbach reads a musician's appearance physiognomically. Quote, he was quite evidently not of Vene Venetian origin, but rather of the Nap Neapolitan comic type, half pimp, half actor, brutal and bold-faced, dangerous and entertaining. The actual words of his song were merely foolish, but in his presentation, with his grimaces and bodily movements, his way of winking suggestively and lasciviously licking the corner of his mouth, it had somewhat indecent and vaguely offensive about it. Though otherwise dressed in urban fashion, he wore a sports shirt out of the soft color of, his, uh, of which his skinny neck projected, displaying a remarkably large and naked Adam's apple. The Adam's apple is really important to Thomas Mann. It appears in a number of, of his descriptions. His pallid, snub-nosed face, the features of which gave little clue as to his age, seemed to be lined with contortions and vice and the grinning of his mobile mouth was rather strangely ill-matched to the two deep furrows that stood defiantly, imperiously, almost savagely, between his reddish brows. In this case, the presumption of physio physiognomic criminality meets the European tradition of racializing Romani musicians, and crime is legible on the face. In both these scenes, filtered by Aschenbach without much narratorial qualification, belonging and unbelonging are a function of facial type. The detective gaze in search of a crime, an inheritance from Poe's The Man of the Crowd, essentially asks the highly charged question, where are you from? And on the basis of face reading, retorts, clearly not from here. In Benjamin's framework, the reading, the reading practice for facial type identifies Aschenbach as a man of the 19th century, a flaneur who, and this is a quote from Benjamin, flatters himself that on seeing a passerby swept along by the crowd, he has accurately classified him, end of quote. For Benjamin, the flaneur flatter, flatters himself with a confidence associated with his practice. Physiognomic skill, in other words, is a fantasy. As Mann's novella advances, Mann's text likewise implies that Aschenbach flatters himself with his mastery of physiognomic knowledge. Through a healthy dose of irony, the narrator sub subtly distances himself from Aschenbach's reading practice, offering it up for contemplation and critique, while reproducing it for narrative effect. So this is what we would call the initial situation of the novella. Aschenbach, as canonical author, tired and in need of relaxation, goes on a trip first to the Adriatic. I have a lot to say about that first trip to the Adriatic at that time in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It does not satisfy Aschenbach's craving for, ex um, for an exotic vacation. Right, and then to Venice, um, which is framed as an exotic place and a gateway to the Middle East. Mann, of course, sets the situation, initial situation up in order to challenge it. The new Aschenbach, post his encounter with Tadio, would also acquire a new face. So I won't say much about Tadio. I'm happy to talk to you about, uh, uh, about how that whole thing works. Um, but I will say that um, Aschenbach's encounter with Tadio is an encounter with what he calls a, per a perfect masterpiece. Uh, and a, a masterpiece is a, a function of perfect form. Tazio, um, Tazio's face offers the model for this, for this form. Um, and it's, it's modeled on the Greek sculpture known as the Spinario. 
So upon the encounter with, uh, with Hadzio and the relaxation of the clenched fist, Aschenbach starts paying more attention to his own appearance. Oh, and I should switch to this. He wears youthful clothes and uses perfume and shows up in the hotel restaurant adorned, geschmückt is the German word, flirting with the figure of the dandy and the text is clearly in dialogue with Dorian Gray and Oscar Wilde's biography. He is visiting a barber working in the Lido. This is very much a makeover scene. Aschenbach gets a makeover and this is the passage. Aschenbach saw in the mirror how his eyebrows were arching in a more well-defined and symmetrical style, how his eyes were growing longer, their brightness enhanced by a slight painting of the lids. Looking farther down, he saw a, light, uh, a lightly applied, gentle carmine appear where the skin had been brownish and leathery. He saw his lips, which had, been with, which had just been anemic, now pouting in a shade of raspberry. He saw the furrows in his cheeks and around his mouth, the wrinkles around his eyes, vanish beneath cream and the breath of um, youth. With beating heart, he caught a sight of a youngster in his prime. The barber doubling as a cosmetician, he is what in the, in the French we call a visagiste, an expert in the face, works to destabilize the physiognomic understanding of inner, outer. The cosmetician proceeds to freshen up what the text refers to Aschenbach's outer man. He dyes his hair, he plucks his eyebrows, he uses eyeliner, lipstick, and blush. Um, the cosmetic arts, in the early modern period, the purview of Venetian courtesans, but also the toolbox of the dandy, camouflage what the other art had engraved on Aschenbach's face. Slowly, a youngster appears in the mirror. The prop for this scene is a mirror, which Venice helped popularize in the modern age. The commercial multiplication of mirrors at the end of the 19th century facilitated a new experience of the face. For Peter Sloterdijk, this experience entails the production of a tension between what he calls a face subject and a face object. The scene reveals in these terms it reveals Aschenbach, up to this point, a face subject, become a face object, working with the help of the barber on his self socialization If the opening of the novella po posits Aschenbach as a masterful observer, this scene transforms him into a spectacle, an object calling on others' visual attention. As the novella plots a change in the narrative's relation to Aschenbach, one aspect of this change involves the sarcasm involved in framing Aschenbach's physiognomic reading practices. From faith, however ambivalent in one's ability to read the face uh, of the minor characters he encounters, to the acknowledgement that the face can be reconfigured aesthetically to make meaning without the assistance of the soul. From Aschenbach as invisible observer to Aschenbach doubling as a visual object of attention. This is a shift anchored on the one hand in the enduring desire to read faces, sedimented into habit of perception, and on the other hand, in the emerging desire to de develop creative practices of what Mina Loy calls autofacial construction. Importantly, man's invocation of the cosmetic art is aligned with the broader discourse of facial transformation during this period. While the cosmetic arts offered a temporary shift in the dynam dynamics of the face, cosmetic surgery offered the temptation of a permanent change. Sander Gilman, no, that's a, um, a history of cosmetic sur surgery, traced the beginnings of cosmetic surgery to this period. In Gil Gilman's view, cosmetic surgery developed particularly on account of the desire to change the appearance, especially the nose, of Jewish men in fin uh, fin de Berlin. Patients, largely Jewish men from Central and Eastern Europe, wanted to be invisible to the physiognomic gaze. Men, more, uh, more often than women, requested a surgery. Facial symmetry was seen as the goal of surgery. Greek sculpture offered models. The surgeon became a sculptor of faces. These are the metaphors used in medical discourse of the time. Patients requesting cosmetic surgery wanted to cease to be a facial type and walk around the city unnoticed by observers like Aschenbach at the beginning of Mann's novella. The hope was that a new face opened the door to social categories from which such patients were excluded. 
in terms proposed by Mann's novella through its minor characters, they wanted to be perceived as belonging to the urban crowd. In exile in the US during World War II, Mann, by this time a Nobel laureate and self-styled cosmopolitan world author, would become the German voice of, uh, of anti-fascism. In one of the polemical essays he wrote, titled Brother Hitler, Mann acknowledged that his early writings risked what he called dangerous forms of simplification. He described death in Venice as containing ideas, and this is a quote, that 20 years later were the property of the man in the street. 20 years from its publication, that is. Physiognomic ideas belong to this category. If thematically the novella dramatizes a shift away from the risk of physiognomic fallacy, it also reproduced it as a means of composition, a, strat a strategy of character construction, the master as face. As such, Mann's novella is witness um, to what I described earlier as the temptation of thinking the unity of inside and outside in a site where does, one does not expect to find it, the physiognomic face as the return of the repressed. So I will leave you with an image of, from our po a poster and the question it raises about the genre of the portrait and the figure of the master um, as perhaps always already facialized, right, in, in, in Deleuzean terms, right, regardless of how blurred that face might be. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anka, so much. It was great. Gregor had to remind me that I'm the moderator. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, and thank you for finishing like this with this. <laughs> Uh, so, questions? I try to please. be short, too. I hope yeah, you appreciate it. Is, it. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, ah, okay, Simon, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anka. This was truly great. Um, I, um, I'm a little bit inconsistent. I mean, everything I'm going to say is going to be inconsistent. It's like the lights are not quite on, just kind of flickering a little bit, <laughs> you know. So, um, sorry? Yes, yes. Um, so, the first thing I wanted to comment on was the, the quote, with which you started, the face is always there, right? Um, and just it occurred to me that, for instance, in psychoanalytic technical situation, the face is never there. The face of the analyst is never there. So I think there's a, a kind of a conscious, there's definitely a link and a substantial one of delimiting the analytical situation from, from uh, you know, uh, from, from the face, from the face as such. Um, now, the, the, the second thing, um, so um, if you propose this term reading faces, then you could say that analysis is about, as a talking cure, is precisely not a reading practice in this sense, and especially not a practice of reading faces. Um, there's also not, but, but there are instances, like for instance in the studies on hysteria, so the, the Freud Breuer book, where uh, faces are featured prominently in, in, um, in situations described. Um, but, of course, the dynamic between the face is not one between the expressive relationship between a face and a character as the inner soul. Um, it's, a, it's a different kind of relationship that's not one of expression. This, this is how far I came when <laughs> listening to you. But um, there is a facial um, entity that is of particular interest to psychoanalysis in that period, at least in the studies on hysteria, and that's the tick, the tick as a as a in eminently facial, let's say, category, but it does not amount or remains irreducible to any kind of relation of um, of of expression. Um, instead of this relationship of expression there's 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 a push or you could you could counter it with the psychoanalytical rebus so a kind of a deciphering rather than a than a reading per se um, and one just like it, there's no question in this but if you would care to comment I would be very happy about that but just one final point since a number of talks spoke about technology and especially the digital systems I wonder if you have any thoughts or how your outline of your, your project would, would apply to a kind of a shift from the face to the interface, mm -hmm. if, if that 
rings any, any bells. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. Thank, thank you for those questions. Um, and, uh, yeah, we should talk. There's a lot to say there. Um, so I'll start perhaps with the last point you made. That, and I've just put my cards on the table to say that like, I, I set out to, to kind of trace a cultural history of the face because of contemporary sites where it seems to me that a certain kind of face is returning, right? And digital technology is one of them. Like, um, some of a friend sent me a, um, a link to an article about a new app, for example, that um, promise you, promises you, asks you which is the better side of your face, and then produces a symmetrical face, right? Where the, the kind of uh, assumption is that, you know, um, most faces are not perfectly symmetrical, and since symmetry is considered to, to be the standard of beauty, this app will, 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 will reveal that, right? So I'm interested in things like that. But also, really, the first um, project in facial recognition actually went by the name of computer physiognomy, right? And imagined itself as a, as a database on the one hand, and then as a, as a, as a taxonomy of faces, right? Um, I'm sure that many of you know that there is a project undertaken by this company called uh, Clearview AI that basically works by way of you will not find many photographs of, of my face on the internet, but uh, you can take any photograph and put it into what is essentially a, a Google search, and it would basically collect all the faces uh, of, uh, it, it recognizes, it, it reads the, the, the biometric uh, information in the face, and it, it collects all the faces that are out, stored anywhere on government sites and so on and so forth, right? So a huge database of a database of faces, which is then sold to commercial uh, uh, commercial companies, but also to government uh, agencies. And you know, there is a huge debate about their use in policing, for example, and the justice system. Right. So, what can literature, what can cultural studies, what can you know the visual arts teach us about the history of the face, and the risks of of um, that, that come with the, with the physiognomic premise, right? So that, that's, where, that's where I'm starting and I'm hoping that that's where I'll, I'll, I'll end with, with, with um, um, hopefully a plan to write a code out to my book on, on, on facial recognition in, in particular. Yeah, but um, I'll put it like this. If, uh, in, the, in the premise of the, of the metaverse, right? The idea that, like, you know, uh, there, there might be some other reality in which we, we might participate. We, we, on, we only take our, our, the biometric information of our faces uh, with us, right? It's, it's the hook uh, between the body and the, um, and the metaverse, right? So I think a lot is at stake in, in, in kind of understanding the, 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 the place of the face in, in these uh, practices and then kind of being able to tell a history. Uh, of that, right? And I will say that the history is quite zigzagging, right? And I, I appreciate what you say about psychoanalysis as perhaps an attempt to move away, right, from the face-to-face -face as the mode of reading and interpretation, right? Um, I guess one thing I will say to that, you know, alongside somebody like Paul Deman or even Deleuze, is you know the kind of the risk that say the proper name always already facializes, right? So that the face actually returns in in language, uh, perhaps sometimes more forcefully than in in, in visual culture, right? Um, I haven't fully worked that that one out, and I hope there is a way to to, to think about that. But yeah, the, the, yeah, for Paul Deman, it, it kind of the, the 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 second you use the proper name, there is a face. Okay, so we have um, Frauke, and I, I don't know your name, yeah, but, and uh, then uh, Andrew. Um, yeah. Thank you, Anka, for, for that brilliant talk. So I was thinking of rhetoric, because in rhetoric, description of the face is a specific stylistic figure, prosopopoia, yeah. and the man wrote on mm -hmm. that. Um, so giving a mask, um, yet the specific logic of that figure um, is that it does not lead to evidence, so no unshowing, right? Um, but fragments are supposed to be whole, and that is, I think, what Zeman said, face is a figure, always a figure of negativity. <laughs> so you never have like an image of 
Asch neither of Aschenbach nor, nor of the gondoliere or, mm -hmm. or the, the hairdresser. So, so whoever is looking for the face, the face is never present. However, we have these dense passa passages uh, in, uh, which are kind of excessive, right? You have adjectives, comparisons, metaphors, allegories. Um, so um, I think the project, the history of the faith, that's really great. But what you, to my mind, what you showed us is that the figure of the faith is like a hysterical figure, a figure of desire, mm -hmm. um, but which, which has something like a desperate drive. I don't know how to express it uh, differently. Do, do you think, can you understand what I, I'm searching for? I think there's a crucial difference between uh, the, the um, like, history of knowledge of the faith, the history of faith, Lavata and all the tradition from 18th century, and that what is ongoing in, in literary text and in art, because it seems to be just the, the, op the opposite side of what, what um, um, the face, the sciences of the faces are, are um, aim at, right? Because it's not a whole, it's just the, the contrary of a whole. It's, it's negativity, but in, in excess, in, mm -hmm. in excess. Um, and I think that would be interesting to follow up on that, because yeah. that would be then a, a specific aesthetic surplus, uh, which you would have reading literature, um, compared to just, you know, doing physiognomy in, in, yeah. in the traces of Lavata, mm -hmm. which, by the way, directly leads to, to the Nazi um, mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and so on and so forth, as you showed us. Yeah, yeah. I, I only put those covers up. I didn't want to go into that, but yeah. Um, so I hear what you're saying. Um, one way I'm thinking about that, right, and I agree with you that there is a, you know, that there is a language of excess that doesn't, like, say, sediment into a positive thing, right? Uh, but one way I'm thinking about that, say, is along other texts, say, by Virginia Woolf that work in very similar ways, um, and where Virginia Woolf explicitly is calling on a reader to fill in this language with, you know, their history, right? So I, I think one of the premises here is that these modernist texts are, like, really minimalist, and they kind of... Um, they're quite ambivalent and they play with various possibilities, right? But that they trust their reader to do the work. And in this case, like, you know, the, say, the invocation of these noses, for example, right? Uh, the, the, the reader becomes basically a, a, a figure that, that confirms the, the physiognomic pact, basically. Okay, thank you. Please. Uh, first of all, thanks for the great talk. I have two points. One of them is kind of interesting, I think, a tendency in digital, no, sorry, in digital technology when it was kind of promised in the 90s to deface completely, to allow for its escape from the face into this anonymity and how it became facialized, mm -hmm. how this technology has turned into technology of facialization. Mm -hmm. And another thing which I think is very interesting uh, is with regard to uh, plastic surgery and how now at the same time that there is this rise um, in a lot of different subcultures and a lot of different um, in, in a lot of different communities, be it trans or mm -hmm. incels, where there is this emphasis of creating a certain face mm -hmm. which has a, a certain idea of, of authenticity, mm -hmm. a face for incel that really shows mm -hmm. being what's dream being a true man or alternatively trying to have a face which fit certain gender norms. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there is this dialectic where as much as it is revealing a true essence, the face, it's also as plastic because there is also the rise of you can achieve this face which shows your essence or mm -hmm. gives you the, will give you retroactively the essence that you desire mm -hmm. through the practice of plastic surgery and how the face at the same time it is as revealing of an, effort, uh, of an essence and creates an essence, mm -hmm. can also, it's also as superficial as plastic surgery and its plasticity of being changed in order to achieve this essence retroactively. Yeah. I am not masculine, but if I'll do this type of surgery, which will give me the face, yeah. of, uh -huh. the face of an, 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 an attractive man, yeah. I will become retroactively a man that I never was yeah. through, the plastic, through the plasticity, through the changing of the surface. Yeah. 
I love what you're saying, and it's it's something that I'm, I'm deeply interested in in this project. Um, there's a wonderful book out there uh, about facial feminization surgery. It's called The Look of a Woman, and has this wonderful line in the introduction that basically says, the face is the new genitalia. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew, and then you are. OK, OK, you are then. <laughs> Okay, now I can. I, I, it's impossible. <laughs> okay, Anka, I, I've been uh, waiting for a lot. I am excited. It was a great talk. Thank you. But I, my, my remark is going to be really disappointing. It's just a very small thing that, I mean, there was a lot, and we will talk later, etc. Uh, I was thinking about the, the beautiful Benjamin quote there, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't remember it from that essay. But thinking about it in the context of the essay is somehow interesting about the, the basic idea of reading and expression because the whole essay is about involuntary memory, mm -hmm. which is precisely a, a, an experience that no one had, right? The idea is that, and so it would mean that the, the face expresses an experience that no one experienced. Mm -hmm. It's only written on the outside, mm -hmm. which, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it builds up for, uh, we're, comp it, it helps maybe think about the, the radical exposure of it. Because yeah. it exposes, this is, I think, where the quotes go yeah. somehow. Okay. So I'm fascinated by that line and that, the, the, the essay on Proust, just okay. generally. Benjamin pretty much is proposing that physiognomy is the key to, to reading Proust and that Proust's work as such is in a physiognomic relation to the 19th century. Right? I, I find that to be like a, a fascinating premise. Um, but then, and there are a number of people who have worked on physiognomy in, 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 in Proust, and I'm sure you remember that there are just faces everywhere. And Swan, for example, is literally described as a collector of faces, right? And he's an um, art historian, right? And, but he goes around collecting faces. We know that Proust collected photo photographs, right? And that uh, he, he played with those in the construction of these, uh, uh, um, of these characters, right? But what the line from, from Benjamin is, is saying is that, you know, experience, vices, thoughts, right? They knocked on the door, right? And somehow they left their traces on the face, but the soul was not there. <laughs> right, so it, it it fully kind of severs this kind of basic premise of of physiognomy, right? That somehow the inside and the outside are are connected, right? But what what it does retain, and this is really interesting, say for Benjamin and Krakauer, um, Bella Balas produced like one of the first theories of cinema as with, with physiognomy as the major the, the core concept, right? What what it leaves us with is this desire to read surfaces, right? Where the face is, is just a surface. It's divorced from the soul. There is no character, right? And yet we continue to read and to project and to play and to, to design methods of also facial construction and so on and so forth, right? So um, that, that's what I see there. And, and, I, and again, I, I find it really kind of productive to, to think with. Thanks, uh, Andrew. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, just following from that point and a little bit from Yuval's is that the idea of the face as a surface especially emerges in this time in the way in which photography mm -hmm. was useful for the science of physiognomy, so mm -hmm. to speak. And um, and in that essay on the history of photography by Benjamin, which is like 1931 or something, a short history of, of photography, 1931, he actually talks about physiognomy in relationship to the photograph to say mm -hmm. that we, you know, the photograph is going to sort of um, position us as subjects and faces to be studied in the sort of physio physiognomic mm -hmm. frame. Um, and then, of course, what, what's next? Uh, Weimar Republic is over. We, now we have Nazi Germany. And then there's a, you know, but what, what photography enabled and what the neat correspondence between the passages that you quote and, and the photographic textual examples of this is the way in which photography through cropping and close-ups and certain kinds of focusing allowed one to piece apart the face and sort of, it's not just a face, sometimes there will be plates that are just eyebrows or plates mm -hmm. that are just eyes and so you start getting the, the face as a kind of a, a, a collection of parts that can be studied individually to tell stories and meanings just like those passages which yeah. is like the lines mean this, the you know cheeks mean that and, and, and so I'm just wondering if there is through photography 
and you know the disparate media that is language and narrative on the one hand and photography on the other hand, whether those could be put side by side as like parallel forms or formations. Yeah. So I, I yeah, I, I fully agree. And there is a version of this project that could be only on photography. Like there's just so much to say there. Uh, and, and Benjamin would be a, a key figure there, right? So in that essay on photography, he pretty much says, you know, we have this new technology, right? And it gives us a new experience of the face. Like suddenly we see the face again, right? And he, um, he, he invokes a number of um, modernist photographers who on, on the left, right, these were progressive artists, right, produced a number of um, physiognomic classifications, right, the, the minor, the worker, the, the, the wife of the worker, and so on and so forth, like August Sanders, right, and Benjamin was fascinated with that, and I think he really way, like, and this is what interests, interests me here, and that's why I'm looking at this period, right? He knew the dangers of physiognomy. He was deeply, deeply aware of them. And at the same time, thought that, you know, one, one has to work with the face, right? That, that there is some, something here that one has to kind of process, right? Rather than just, uh, than just put aside. And I, I think he like really actively worked to develop a progressive and modernist version of physiognomy. And, and you know, with, with all the risks involved. Thank you. Uh, Francis? Okay. Thank you. This is kind of a footnote, but uh, I just wanted to mention that Agamben has an essay on the face, and he has stated that the most erotic part of the body, and he probably means the woman's body, is the face. And it has to do with his idea of, of the veil. Mm -hmm. um, since he privileges the veil and kind of puts down uh, any kind of stripping off of a veil. Mm -hmm. So with the rest of the body, you have clothing that has to be stripped off to create mm -hmm. erotic excitement, which, which he says privileges the clothing and not the body. Because mm -hmm. once you get to the body, you're not that thrilled. Yeah. That's his idea. You're interested more in the stripping, the experience of stripping, but with the face, you get this pure nudity. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that essay. I have to say that I don't quite know what to do with his notion of the naked face. I, 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 I don't think the face is ever naked, right? No, there's always stuff there. There's always, there, there are layers and layers of masks. Um, yeah. And I, I and, yeah, I see the, the temptation to think about the naked face, right? But um, yeah, um, my side of that, I teach, I, I teach in a comparative literature department, and one of my favorite texts ever is this uh, history of the novel in Japan uh, by Kojin Karatani. And what he basically says is that when the novel came to Japan, they, uh, uh, it invented the face. That there was no such thing in, in Japan. Of course, there were faces, right? But that, you know, the, the novel, the Western novel, brought with it an experience of the naked face, but that precisely the naked fa face as an invention, as a novelistic. Yes, invention. Peter, please. Uh, Anka, thank you for this presentation. Um, um, I, I, would, I would just relate to what Francis just mm -hmm. asked you. But before that, just a short remark. Maybe you are not aware, you were talking about Mahler. And there's mm -hmm. a short uh, history of Mahler and Ljubljana, because he, for oh, the short period of I time he was in Ljubljana. <laughs> and outside is near the case? Ljubljanica river, the, uh, there is a statue of oh, Mahler. Okay. So, and Thank the you. picture you presented uh, does not exactly match the, the statue. <laughs> so, uh, it would be interesting to compare it. Okay. Um, regarding the face, um, I have this uh, stupid idea that in a way, um, face is also a mask, and uh, that this uh, tradition you were just uh, describing, uh, trying to read from the face, everything is, is somehow in an impasse. But this is just, yeah. the, ju just a side remark. Uh, in my book on capitalism and perversion, uh, the, the central chapter, chapter was on pornography. And in pornography, pornography is a big business which tries to sell the enjoyment and the idea that the enjoyment is real. Mm -hmm. So the enjoyment is there 
And uh, from the male's perspective, it's simple as that. You know, you can see the ejaculation, you can see the money shot. Mm -hmm. Whereas from the women's perspective, it's a, there's a trouble, mm -hmm. and the camera focuses then on the body and uh, mm -hmm. and especially on the face, on the grimaces of the face, mm -hmm. and in that way they try to uh, convince the the viewers that the enjoyment is really there. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the, the one thing that uh, pornography as commodity tries mm -hmm. to sell, the real thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, concerning the nudity and the garment, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm deeply interested in that. Um, what do I have to say back to it right now? I'm not super sure. I have a friend who's, who works on, um, she called, has a, a book out that's called Porn Work. It's about porn as a form of sex work and therefore as, as, as labor. It's fascinating and it's, it's anchored in, in, in interviews with uh, porn workers. And they're deeply, like, one, one thing that fascinates me about that is the, like, they, they have insurance on their face. It's, it's the face that needs to be insured so that you, you, you make sure you don't lose your livelihood as, as a porn worker uh, because that's where the, the money shot is. I will inquire and I will let you know. <laughs> okay. I'm sure my friend Heather knows. <laughs> uh, um, I'd really like to, to, to give a comment as well, if I may. If, are there some more questions? Otherwise, because we have one minute left. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'll just say that um, from Lacanian like, say, perspective, you, I would say there are two, uh, two things. One is uh, that um, the subject is making himself a picture for the gaze of the other mm -hmm. constantly. So the, the, the face is a construction um, which is always a mask or a semblance. Mm -hmm. The other is that uh, from the mirror stage, the recognition of the subject in the mirror, of his, his own image, mm -hmm. and this symbolic identification with this ideal ego, mm -hmm. which is actually making him a subject on the imaginary level. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to like comment is that I, I was working, I, I, I'm, I did a research on the interface, on the face, mm -hmm. uh, face on the internet recently, and I, I found some, like, for me, very interesting things. One is now, in the recently, like last year and, or two years, um, expansion of morphing, morphing apps, face morphing apps, mm -hmm. which means that um, you can make your face with, a, with an app, um, which, uh, uh, okay, so you put your photo in the algorithm, and the algorithm would, would make it, like, bigger eyes, uh, longer lashes, higher chin, softer skin with no, like, spots, uh, fuller mouth, um, yeah, and so on. And, um, what, like, like, in, like, some radical, of course, uh, or extreme, extreme uh, examples, like people would start to identify with their morphed image mm -hmm. rather than with their like, mm -hmm. and what, so, and then the American, American aesthetic uh, surgeons reported that, okay, 10 years ago, there were people coming, started to come uh, to show them that, that they want a surgery to look better on the internet. So this was their goal. But now, very recently, they start coming with this morphing app picture, like saying, please make my face like this. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the twist. And okay, and a another thing which is also like <laughs> extreme is this body, uh, this body dysmorphic disorder, uh, which has two, um, like extreme, uh, again, um, versions. One is that people would constantly want to uh, s uh, see their face. So you can see these women or men who cannot go pass by the window not looking into their face. But if you like make it this into extreme, this is one extreme. The other is that they, they would cover their face completely because they cannot bear uh, showing their face or seeing its face. So. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. the comment. Thank you for that comment. Um, so one of the many benefits of Zoom, it, uh, it's, it's produced a boom in the cosmetic industry. Uh, people want better Zoom faces. And yeah. I, yeah, and it's also that this uh, 
apps are of course making a Eurocentric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is the this is the model. Like the, the yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's mostly noses and eyelids that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Are, are being uh, fixed, right? Yeah. So uh, that that's true. The longer history of that, though, I uh, I find really fascinating, and this goes back to the questions about photography. So, I, I've been working on a chapter on Proust and the construction of the character of Odette, who, in an initial step, uh, is uh, is kind of constructed as a character through a crisis in relation to a Botticelli painting. Right? But then, in the second volume of the, uh, of the recherche, Odette kind of takes charge of her self-presentation as a character, right? And she produces herself as Madame Swan. Mm. And what she uses as a prop is her own photograph made in a studio mm. professionally, yeah, yeah. right? So she, she, she wants to become this photograph, yeah. right? And the conceit in Proust, uh, you know, thousands of pages later, is that she remains unchanged, right? Uh, uh, until the end of the novel, right? So when, when you have the Val de Tet, uh episode, uh, everybody has aged. They're all masks of their former selves. I love that, oh, <laughs> that, that scene, right? Uh, except Odette, who has remained her photograph, mm. right? <laughs> because she, she has always already kind of um, modeled herself on, mm. on, on that photograph. Yeah, so there is a long history of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank you. And I think like what's interesting here is to kind of think, you know, to think through this history, but also kind of see what, what you know, what these new yes. technologies yes. are producing and why and what, what, what old and new desires they are trying to, to, to meet. Mm. Great. Thank you. Anka, thank you. Thank you.